I wish you luck in realizing your ambition. Hey everyone, it's Blue Lizard Jello, and welcome back to Everything Possible in Elden Ring. Last time we didn't do much. Uh, let's face it, we got just about nowhere. However, I still think it was a good introductory episode because it does give you a bit of a feel for what the first few, maybe several episodes are going to be like. They are going to be a bit slow going. Uh, number one, I have no intention of rushing this walkthrough, nor do I have any intention on creating a how to get overpowered in seven minutes and defeat the final boss uh, in a single hit type guide. But I do want to take my time early on to kind of set the precedent and to go over many of the mechanics somewhat in depth so that new and seasoned players alike can get something out of these early episodes and then later on we'll be able to go a little bit faster because the mechanics will have already been explained in previous parts. But last time we did get through the tutorial, well, the very beginning of the tutorial, really the tutorial is behind me, but we did defeat the Grafted Scion, we got 3200 runes, we got the Ornamental straight sword, and we got the Great Shield from the Grafted Scion. But as you can see on this character, I do not have the swords, I do not have the shield, and you can look in the bottom right, I do not have the runes. I did recreate this character and purposefully died, actually I ran off the cliff as soon as I saw the scary grafted scion, so we could start together here with zero runes and only the starting equipment and the keepsake that we started with. At the beginning of every episode, I will show you my status, and then I'll tell you if you want to see my stats for any longer, go ahead and pause the video now. And I'll also show you my gear, which is only what we've started with. As a Vagabond, we have the Longsword, the Halberd, the Heater Shield, the Vagabond set. I did take the Helm off for now. And then we did get the, the Flask of Crimson Tears and the Flask of Cerulean Tears after we awoke from our slumber, if you will, down in the puddle. And we were visited by a stranger riding a horse, and we'll talk more about her and that mount later on. But I want to spend a little bit of time actually talking about these flasks. These flasks are very interesting. The Flask of Crimson Tears and the Flask of Cerulean Tears. At the end of the last episode, I did say when you rest at a Site of Grace, which we will do here very shortly, you refill all of your flasks, but you also have the option to increase the number of charges or uses if you have a Golden Seed, which you could have started with as a keepsake. You can also increase its potency using a Sacred Tear, which we won't get for a little bit, but you can also reallocate. This right here is a combination flask. So even though they are separate items, they do share essentially the same inventory. I have three crimsons and one cerulean, but I can have four crimson and zero cerulean. I can have zero crimson, four cerulean, or I can split it down the middle however I'd like. This is what's really interesting. The flask of crimson tears at base level, so these have not been upgraded, restores 250 hit points per use. And of course, right now I have three. At its maximum, I can have a total of 14 charges or uses between these two, again split anyway, and a maximum potency of plus 12. At plus 12, this will restore 810 HP. The Flask of Cerulean Tears restores your FP, essentially your mana in this game. At its base level, as it is right now, it restores 80 FP. At its maximum potency, it will restore 220. But here is what's intriguing. This heal is actually inferior in some ways to the Flask of Cerulean Tears, even when we're concerning HP. And the reason is sacred incantations have some heals that even at low level can be extremely useful. In fact, the base level incantation caster, which is a finger seal, which you can get pretty early, requires only 10 faith to use that seal. Then you can pick up the heal incantation, which is the most basic heal in the game, and that can be cast with only 12 faith, restores almost 250 HP. And that is at 12 faith with the basic level of heal. 250, it's, I think it's about around 248 HP technically, but it only requires 35 FP. So if you consider that right now, let's take a look and see how much FP we have. My FP is only 78. So one use of the Cerulean Tears will completely refill my HP. I can get two heals using the Finger Seal at only 12 Faith, so that's only three levels of investment since I am currently level nine in Faith. And I can cast Heal twice for one Cerulean Tear Flask. If I were to reallocate all of my flasks and have four Flasks of Cerulean Tears and I had 12 Faith, 
the finger seal and the regular heal, I could get eight heals instead of only four with the Flask of Crimson Tears. The biggest drawback is that it is slower. So you have to really time your heals well, and it's something that if you're going to do in combat can be very difficult. So we are gonna be playing around with Faith. We'll definitely be using incantations, especially heals, because they actually have another use much later on uh, against a very difficult enemy. We'll touch on that when we get closer, but uh, just a really interesting thought experiment of instead of investing in Crimson Tears and running a lot around with a lot of these and only a few Cerulean, I would argue maybe only have one or two crimson that you can use in the heat of the moment, whereas your flask of cerulean tears can be used for your standard heal. So just keep that in mind. And then of course the land between rune, this is our keepsake. We won't be using this until we have the ability to actually spend those runes. Otherwise, we put ourselves at risk of losing all of them. Right, here we are several minutes in. I haven't even moved from this spot. I think it's time we made a little bit of progress, but there will be more mechanic talk as we go. We have another developer message, and it has to be a developer message because, again, I am offline. It says, the Cave of Knowledge lies below. This was actually added in a an update. I don't know if it was 1.04, somewhere along there, because a lot of people, apparently, were skipping this drop. Now, it's completely optional. Essentially, this is just a short cave. There are tutorial messages that will pop up to teach you about some mechanics. I have turned those off, and I'll just be walking through most of them during this cave. But enough players were bypassing this altogether and just going to that door, which is completely acceptable, but the developers saw fit to actually put it in to let you know, hey, no, no, you may want to drop down. And even though you go up to this friendly ghost, Brave Tarnished, take the plunge of learning and remembrance. Recall the arts of war and your warrior's blood. The ghost tells you to drop down and people are still bypassing it. Hmm. Now, a couple things to take note of. Number one, there is a shiny up in that ledge. You actually have to leave and take kind of a, a roundabout way to get that item, but it's nothing we need anytime soon. That item, however, up on the ledge is kind of the reward for doing the tutorial area, so we'll be getting that here momentarily. Be on the lookout for trees like this. Basically, earth tree saplings as far as I'm concerned. Now, right here, there's nothing, but typically when you see one of these, there will be a golden seed lying underneath. My thought process is that the mysterious character in the NPC in the first episode actually used the golden seed to create the flask that we were then given when we awoken. Right, so ignore that door for now. Let's go ahead and take the plunge. Now fall damage is a thing in Elden Ring, although it is very, very generous. So you can hop down here very easily and then just drop down there for safety. However, just so you can see the fall damage very minor considering that fall and there are ways to protect yourself from fall damage we'll talk about that as we get the ability to either use that talisman the gear or the crafting item that we can get um, however even if you use an item like that if it's a fatal fall it is always a fate well just about always a fatal fall uh, i'll touch on that again once we get to the uh well a necessary time but normally it's going to be a fatal fall regardless and there are ways to tell if it's going to be a fatal fall here is our very first sight of grace so lost grace discovered let's go ahead and rest and take a look at the options we have we can pass the time there is a day night cycle in elden ring most of the time it doesn't matter there are a few enemies that will awaken during the nighttime and they will be asleep during the day or vice versa, diurnal versus nocturnal. There are also some bosses that will only appear at nighttime. And then there's also a couple other weird things that happen at very specific times, but normally you don't need to pass the time. Flasks, this is where we can do all those things I already mentioned. We can add the charge if we have golden seeds, we can increase the amount replenished if we have sacred tears, and we can reallocate the flask charges. Now, I don't have any heals, so I am only going to keep a single Cerulean Flask on me for now. Once we get the heal, we'll probably change that up. We can also memorize spells. If we have either spells or incantations, we could do so here. We don't have any at the time. We do have two slots for them. We can also sort the chest. So we do start essentially with a bottomless box. If you are one who likes to keep their inventory nice and neat, which I will probably try to do during this walkthrough, you do have the ability to throw things in there. Not everything can be uh, sent over, but most things can. 
but for example, if I want to send my lands between rune into the chest because I'm too afraid I'm gonna use it, then I can just click on that and it will go and switch to the chest. And then if I want to switch to the chest, look at the tooltips in the bottom, switch to chest as triangle for me, and then I can throw it right back in my inventory. And that's all we can do for now. There's several other options that will open up as we go through the game. We have our first minor enemies here, our first little dreglings here, if you will. And there's uh, something to talk about here, believe it or not. I know, Blue, imagine that. You can draw everything out to a long-winded discussion. <laughs> yes, yes I can. But I do want to talk about something that I don't see talked about too often, and it's not something that'll come up a lot, but it's actually the overkill mechanic. The overkill mechanic has been around for several of the From Software games, and essentially you get an extra 20% more runes, since we're in Elden Ring or Souls in previous games, if you deal 150% of the, rem the remaining HP that the enemy has in a single blow. Really convoluted. Let me show you in action. So for this enemy, I'm just going to attack with a couple of, well, actually a single <laughs> R1, and I got 11 runes. This same enemy, however, over here, Let's bait out an attack, and I'm going to just loop around for a backstab. And notice I just got 14 runes. It is a plus three difference. On these minor enemies, it really makes almost no difference, but extra runes are extra runes. So that mechanic has carried over, and I don't see too many people talking about it. So essentially go for the most damage you can. I know, what a revelation. Now that was a critical attack, that was a backstab, and I did that just by circling around to the enemy, so let me go ahead and do that again. So I'm going to put my shield up, and then right when I get behind, I just use a light attack, and there's my backstab for another 14 runes. Another way of actually getting a critical, like we saw in the Grafted Sign fight, is a parry. Let's see if I can get one on this. Way, way delayed. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> also delayed. One more time. <laughs> this is going swimmingly. We'll just cut to the successful parry wall. There we have it. Easy. Just ignore the fact that I'm almost dead and have no flask of crimson tears left. <laughs> but there we have another parry, and we are going to talk more about parries and specifically timings and which tools you should use and when another time. But I'm actually going to go back and rest because that was uh, embarrassing, and I'll edit some of that out, but I'll let you see some of it because failures are certainly a part of this game. But that is one of the other criticals, but that's not the only one. Another one, we're going to have to wait for a stronger enemy. Another one is simply the guard break critical. And the guard break critical is essentially we deal enough stagger damage in order to get an enemy to have their guard or stance broken, which opens them up typically for a critical. Not all enemies are open for a critical after that. Let's continue. Of course, we do have the ability to jump now, and the jump is not only a way to traverse, but it is also a chance to attack. You have both light and heavy attacks when you jump. Very nice. Those deal a lot of stance damage. Now here we have an enemy up above shooting at us with a crossbow. With the shield, it is absolutely fine. We take almost no stamina damage, and we take absolutely no health damage. But we can just walk on by him. And over here, we actually get our very first ingredient. Notice these flowers growing here, or actually these berries, and as we pick them up, we get a Rawa fruit. Rawa fruit is something you will find pretty much everywhere here in the Lands Between, and I encourage you to pick them up just about every time. There are lots and lots of crafting recipes, from the absolute mo most basic, which can heal our mount, to something that we will use pretty much before every boss fight going forward. So if you see the Rawa fruit, definitely pick them up. Now we are also going to be taking a look at the stealth mechanic here in a little bit, but this enemy hopefully will allow us to break their stance and you can see what a guard break or a stance break critical looks like. He is gonna put up his shield here in just a moment. So every damage, every bit of damage you can do, whether it's from a melee weapon or a spell, an incantation, a throwable, deals stance damage along with it. If you can get enough stance damage on the enemy, 
then their stance is broken and often they'll be opened up for a critical. But it is a meter, a meter that we can't see. Meaning, if I attack this enemy and then back up, his stance is now being recovered. In fact, if you give him enough time, it recovers pretty quickly. So if you want to break their stance, you really do have to attack pretty quickly. But as you might guess, the weapon type, the weapon damage, and the type of attack will all influence just how much stance damage you do. With my longsword, a single R1, that is not much stance damage at all. An R2, that's considerably more. You can see he actually flinched. I can also do my square off. In fact, I will go ahead and let's see, back up. No, don't want to do anything. I'm going to try a square off with a heavy attack here. And there is the break. You can hear that noise. He opens himself up for a critical. And that was because I broke his stance. Some other really good options, and you'll see people use this quite a bit, are jump R2s. Jumping R2s will deal a lot of stance damage regardless of the weapon. But obviously the bigger and beefier your weapon is, such as the colossal weapons, those will do a ton. Now a charge heavy attack from a colossal sword pretty much deals the maximum amount of stance damage that you can get, whereas a dagger, for example, and a very light attack is going to be just about the least. So a couple more basic enemies here. Go ahead and just do some really good damage here. Try and get that overkill bonus. There we have it. Excellent. But now we have this enemy up here. This is the one who was shooting the crossbows at us. The critical damage is something else we also need to talk about because this is just peculiar. The critical damage, whether it is a repost, a backstab, or a guard break critical, is influenced. The damage itself is influenced by the overall attack power of your weapon, any critical damage modifier, for example, and I'll show that here in a second, the long sword, um, well here, let me run away and I'll show that off. It's going to be more effective once we have an item that has something better than this, but if you actually, not a screenshot, my apologies. I'll get there. I'll get there. That's what I want. I wanted the explanation. Right down here at the bottom, you have a critical modifier. Most weapons in the game have a critical modifier of 100. In essence, it's not being modified. You can see that the halberd also has a modifier of 100. There is a version of the long sword that we can farm from some of the Godric soldiers in a little bit that will have a 110 modifier. Here's where it gets really weird. You can't compare the modifier to other weapon types. This is a straight sword. This is a halberd. You can see with the class or from the class just underneath the name. You can only compare to other weapons within the same category. So straight sword to straight sword, halberd to halberd, etc. If it does have a critical modifier of 110, 130, 140, then it should be doing more critical damage than its 100 counterparts. But it is also impacted by a certain gear, like the dagger talisman, which can increase it. So. It's really hard and you really need to uh, play around with it because the question is, okay, am I going to do more critical damage from a maxed out colossal hammer or a maxed out dagger and get a backstab on it? So definitely something worth playing around, but let's just sneak around this guy. Easy backstab. Okay, we're almost at the stealth component, but I'll just do a running, I'll miss with a running R2, but how about a running jumping R2 on him? And here is where the game is going to teach us about stealth. And stealth is enabled simply by crouching. For me, it's using the left analog stick, clicking that in. I am now in stealth. I'm a lot harder to detect, and that allows me to sneak up on enemies, get backstabs. But it also means that if an enemy is undetected when I attack, whether that is melee, uh, range damage through a bow or a spell, or at a consumable, they will actually take a 20 to 25% extra damage simply because they were not aware. So if I sneak up on this enemy, I'm going to try just a charged R2. You can see it, 185 just from that charge. Another enemy up here. We do have this foliage that we can use to our advantage. Makes it easy, even easier to sneak. So let's get behind him. And this time, I'm just going to tap R1 for the backstab. And you can kind of get a sneak peek right through that window there in the rocks. That is going to be our first, well, not our first boss, but our first boss outside of the very optional 
crafted scion. So this enemy, interestingly enough, has more health, and essentially they put this enemy in here just to show you that enemies are going to scale differently, and it asks you to kind of put some of your new skills into effect. So I'm actually going to, just because we haven't shown it yet, show off the charge forth of the halberd. So remember, we can either hit it once or we can hold it for an even longer charge. I'm going to hold it down. And then we'll just switch over, finish them off with some R1s. The charge attack is really good for knocking enemies off of their feet. In fact, you can stun lock even some rather dangerous Caden type enemies early on with the charge attack. This right here is a stake of America. This stake of America is an optional respawn point. So if I were to go through that fog wall and die, oh, I hope I don't die. I will be given the option to either return to the last site of grace that I rested at or this nearby stake of America. Now, we can very clearly see that Stake America, but they're not always visible. Well, they're always visible, but sometimes they're a little bit hidden. But if I leave, notice up on my stamina bar... Right here, this is when I'm in range. That symbol, that little, well, the statue symbol, even though this symbol up there has her arms and these ones do not, that is indicating that I am near Stake America and I can respawn there. So always look for that symbol, even if you haven't seen the statue itself. So now we have our, well, tutorial boss. Not the Grafted Scion, but we have the Soldier of Godric. The Soldier of Godric, bless his heart, he is certainly going to try. But this individual is an absolute pushover. In fact, look at this. That is a single R1. 62 damage, and that is about an eighth of his overall health. So a really good opportunity to practice your parries, your backstabs, even your guard break. In fact, I think I would like to try and break his guard. So I'm going to do that by switching over to my sword. And I'm going to do some jumping R2s. And look at that. One jumping R2 is enough to break his stance. And then a stance break critical later. The enemy has been felled. And we're rewarded with 400 runes. And that is the Cave of Knowledge. I don't know that I could have done that any slower or with any more explanation. I'm both sorry and you're welcome. Our reward is the strength gesture and I did show last time how you can switch those out just by going to your inventory and just playing around with this menu over here. I haven't talked yet about the pouch. So we have the hotbar and that is accessed by going into your equipment and then filling out these 10 slots right here. By the way, Having 10 slots can be a little bit difficult to navigate, so be a little bit um, conscious of what you're including on your hotbar versus what you're using in your item pouch, something that I'm somewhat infamously not very good at. But you can remove it on this controller at least by just using square. Clicking on any of the slots there will allow you to go in and then navigate to the item you want. A nice feature, this is not the first time FromSoft Game has had this, but if you're in your weapon, your armor, or your hotbar, you can also switch to the next slot by using the bumpers, right bumper and left bumper. Notice in the very top left, it says quick item one. If I want to go to quick item two, a right bumper will bring me there and then I can equip my flask of cerulean tears. Similarly, if I took off all my armor and I wanted to quickly put it back on, I could go to my head, equip, right bumper, equip, right bumper, etc. Of course, I'm gonna take off the helm because well, I spent time on this character and I only want a medium roll. The flat or the pouch is different. Right now, I have the Memory of Grace equipped. First off, I have no intention of ever using the Memory of Grace. This item, when used, means you give up all of your runes, so I would lose my 659 runes, and it returns you to the last side of Grace. But fast travel is immediately unlocked in Elden Ring. The only times you can't are typically when you are in a a, either a cave or a catacomb and the boss is not dead then you can't actually fast travel out of it but provided those conditions are not met you can just fast travel meaning the memory of grace is really only for times where if you are in combat meaning you can't actually uh, escape an enemy and you can't fast travel because it won't let you fast travel then uh, and often when you're stuck which it can happen sometimes the geography of the game means you do get stuck in certain places and you can't fast travel that's about the only time i can think of using this however if i want to switch it up using triangle here i could put on let's say my flask of cerulean tears now you can't have both 
an item or an item both in your pouch and your hotbar. It is only one or the other, which I pr would prefer if they would actually allow that. But I'm going to get rid of the memory of grace. So now my hotbar only has my flask of crimson tears. And then if I hold down my interact button, there is my flask. So my flask is up on the D pad. Okay, so that indication or that diagram right there is indication of up left right and down on my directional pad so if i were to use up on the d-pad while i'm holding the interact i would use my flask of cerulean tears there are two more slots over here that are not assigned to a directional pad and those have to be accessed just like we just did by going into our menu and then coming over here so i would not put anything vital over here Put fun items over here like the telescope if you want to occasionally stop and take a look around at your surroundings. Right. Anyway, that is it for the Cave of Knowledge, so let's drop down. Finally open up these doors. And here we already have another Site of Grace. If you are paying attention, the Lost Sites of Grace are pretty much all over the place. You can find one without traveling too terribly far. But we are going to rest. That will refill our flasks and, of course, all of our health. Now, over here, we have this impenetrable fog wall. Not something that we can just cross. But we have this curious-looking statue directly to its left. And if you look at this statue, this is a pair of imps standing on each other there is a slot for an item in both of their heads use the stone sword key i can say yes all i want i didn't start with them we have no stone sword keys in our inventory if you started with the stone sword keepsake you actually get two of them this statue requires two stone sword keys other statues will only take one you just have to pay attention to the statue itself to know Inside here is an area called the Fringe Folk Heroes Grave, and let me tell you, if you want to go here at base level right away, go nuts. Have fun. There is some really good loot, but it is also very tough even for seasoned players, or at least for me. If you started with the keys and you go in there, you could try to run. You can try and dodge some of the incredibly dangerous and, well, one of them a, a currently unkillable enemy, and you can get the loot. You can even get all the way through to the boss. There is a boss at the very end. Uh, and to that, I just say, good luck. I am not showing that because I don't recommend you do it at this time. We'll come back much later on. But we do have some loot over here. And this is the Finger Severer and the Tarnished Furled Finger. These are online items. So again, I won't really be showing them off typically in this walkthrough. But I will have a dedicated section for online components. But the Tarnished Furled Finger, this is how you put your sign down to be summoned into other players' worlds to do cooperative play. The Finger Severer allows you to either send phantoms home if you summon someone into your world, you could send them home with this. Or if you are the summon because you put down your Tarnished Furled Finger, you can use this to go home yourself. With co-op, with PvP, there are level restrictions. In fact, not just level restrictions, but weapon upgrade restrictions. The host level and their highest level of weapon upgrade, even if it's a weapon you didn't upgrade yourself, maybe it was dropped uh, for you by another player, maybe it was dropped by an enemy or an NPC that you killed, or if it's a unique item that naturally just has a higher level to it, those levels and weapon upgrade levels will actually reflect in what player's signs you're able to see. Same goes with PvP. But if you put on a password, which if I go into my inventory, you'll see that multiplayer is grayed out. It doesn't even let me show you it. There is a password system, and if you use the password system, it completely negates all of the restrictions. It will, however, any summon that you bring into your world will be scaled down to roughly your level to make it a little bit more fair so your summons just can't steamroll for you. Although, let's face it, you can still steamroll pretty well. But like I said, we're going to do a dedicated section on uh, online components another time. You're going to see lots and lots of these elevators. Very, very simple. Just stand on the pressure plate. Do, 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 do
I adore this first glimpse into the lands between. You have the glorious earth tree that we saw from the starting area. You actually have an area just above my head there that I'm not going to mention just now, but it's really, really impressive and cool that you can see it this early on. You have some divine towers out in the distance. You have that incredible regal looking castle out there. And you also, if you take notice, see what looks to be a chapel and a, a large statue uh, just over there with the wooden bridge, actually a couple wooden bridges. That is actually where we just came from. That is the chapel of anticipation just above me. So we came quite a ways just to end up here in Limgrave. We have an NPC, we have a Sight of Grace, we have a Shiny over here, we have a patrolling individual on a horse. We're not going near him anytime soon. So if you want to fight him at this level, just like the French Folk Hero Grave, hey, good luck. Don't tell him Blue sent you, because I most certainly did not. But to start off, we're going to rest at this Sight of Grace, we're going to talk to that NPC, and then we're going to start making our way, kind of in a circuitous fashion, to that building straight ahead. Rest up. No new options yet. But folks, I'd like to introduce you to Whiteface Vari. Oh yes. Tarnished, are we? Come to the lands between for the Elden Ring? Hmm? Of course you have. No shame in it. Unfortunately for you, however, you are maidenless. Without guidance without the strength of runes, and without an invitation to the round table hold, you are fated, it seems, to die in obscurity. He's such a pleasant and happy-go-lucky individual, but he has already mentioned a few things that are important. Number one, we are maidenless. Apparently, not having maiden is um, something that is looked down upon here in the Lands Between. But we also don't have an invitation to the round table hold, and therefore, as he said, we are fated to die in obscurity. While well, being a tarnished of no renown, that's kind of what our fate was meant to be in the beginning. We does have some more to say so far. Luckily for you, however, there is one shining ray of hope for even the maidenless. Me, Vare. Take care to listen. Are you familiar with grace? The golden light that gives life to you tarnished. You may also behold its golden rays pointing in a particular direction at times. That is the guidance of grace, the path that a tarnished must travel. Hmm, indeed. Grace's guidance holds the answers. It will lead you tarnished to the path you are meant to follow, even if it leads you to your grave. Grace's guidance will reveal the path forward, most certainly, to Castle Stormvale, over on the cliff, the home of the decrepit demigod, Godric the Grafted. It's time you set off, I should think. To Castle Stormvale on the cliff, where Grace would guide you, if you seek the Elden Ring, maidenless as you are. So he is telling us that we should begin by heading up to Castle Stormvale, home of Godric the Grafted, which is directly over my head. He also mentioned, though, the guidance of Grace. And sure enough, you can see from this site of Grace, there is this faint line heading out in this direction. If you're ever unsure of where to go and you want to get back on the main path, sit at a site of grace and see where it is suggesting you go. Not every site of grace has one, but a lot of them do. And if you follow it, it will essentially carry you down the main storyline. But that is not what we're going to be doing today. You can also see this on your map. Now, we don't actually have any map fragments, so it's going to be blank. But if I hit the touchpad on my DualSense controller, you can see just well, a little bit of an outline. We'll find a map fragment later on, but from this side of Grace, it'll tell you what NPCs are nearby, and it'll also show you the guidance of Grace from this, well, side of Grace. Like I said, we are ultimately heading in that direction today, but first I want to loop around behind this building because there's a few collectibles 
that we can get. And I want to also introduce the idea of hunting. Yes, there is a shiny there, but we'll be picking up here uh, soon. There's some more rawa fruit that we picked up in the Cave of Knowledge. There's some birds there over on the cliff. We'll be dealing with them here shortly. Here we have our first Erdleaf flower. Erdleaf flowers can craft Furl Calling Finger Remedies, which are important for playing online, Warmy Stones, and Grace Mimics. And again, we're going to talk about all these as we get the ability to craft them. I'm just giving you the idea of what they are for. We also have these absolutely adorable looking Jerboas, I believe is the closest animal equivalent or real life equivalent that we have. But all the enemies or all the animals that you can find can be killed. And of course that one didn't drop anything, but when an enemy drops an item, there will actually be a flash of white indicating that they're gonna have something that you can loot. Let's see if we can get one of these birds to drop something for us. So I'm just going to target using the right analog stick and then just charge with an R1. There we have it, that one gets away. But that flash of white indicates that an enemy has dropped loot and we get a flight pinion. Flight pinions, which of course are gonna be dropped from birds, are gonna be very important for fletched arrows, arrows that have a further fly distance when fired from a bow. Another couple of Jaboas here. And he dropped thin beast bones. Any small animal can drop the thin beast bones and thin beast bones are really good for bone knives, which we can craft very early on, as well as a bunch of different arrows and bolts. So thin beast bones plus the flight pinions will give us a nice source of arrows early on. You can always Bethesda your way up if need be. So I'm turning around because I did actually overlook this. I didn't overlook it, but I kind of misplaced it. I've mentioned before, and I will probably mention this a few times, I am colorblind, so some of these items can be a little bit difficult for me to spot, and I have to just memorize where they are. But this red leaf back here is an arteria leaf. There is a difference between this, the rawa fruit, the erd leaf, and other items that we're going to be collecting today as we run up to that church. Let's go and look at the description. We're going to go into our inventory. I'm going to use my right bumper to go over to the crafting materials. And let's take a look at the description of rawa fruit. Easily found everywhere in the lands between, wide variety of uses. Flight pinion, commonly used for air fletchlings, commonly used. Doesn't really say anything about its rarity, but if we read the arteria leaf, it says exceedingly rare to find. If it says exceedingly rare to find, it actually has nothing to do with its rarity or scarcity, but it has everything to do with whether or not it responds when you rest at a site of grace. If I go rest right now at the site of grace by Whiteface Vari, Rawa fruit responds, Erdly flowers respond, all the animals I can hunt respond. The Arteria leaf, however, will not respond. So this one we just collected back here is the only one we can get from here. It can be farmed from enemies later on, but in terms of getting this one, it is just a one-stop shop. But what can you actually get from that? Well, nothing right now. It's going to take a while, but we can make Exalted Flesh, Uplifting Aromatic, and Blood Boil Aromatic. But again, that is considerably down the road. I'm going to try and get another bird or two here. Now that one just flew off the cliff, but there's another flight pinion. You can also get a foul foot from these birds, although there are other birds that drop them more frequently. But the other thing that I'm looking for that I'm not seeing right now are skulls that have glowing eyes. Once I see one, I'll explain why those are important. Actually, there's one right there. Perfect. So let's bypass this item. Let's go here. And I'm just going to roll over it to break it. And inside we get a Golden Rune Level 1. Golden Runes are just like the Lands Between Rune. They are hard runes or consumable runes. If I were to break that Golden Rune Level 1, I would get 200 runes. That's not a ton, but early on, I mean, that's a third, a little bit less than a third of what I currently have. And those skulls can be found quite frequently. You can even, once we get the mount ability, you can even ride over them and collect them while on your mount, which is very helpful early on. Especially if you just get, you know, within just 400, 600 runes of another level, or if you're trying to buy something, you can save those for when the need arises. On this little epitaph, this little statue here, if you don't pick this up here, the next time you find one of these summoning pools, you'll be able to collect it there. It'll kind of move with you until you finally collect it. But this shiny is the small golden effigy. Using the small golden effigy will allow you to send your sign to these places called summoning pools. So I'm gonna examine this. 
so I have activated this summoning pool. Previously, using the small golden FG would only allow you to oh, grab this rower fruit, send it to one summoning pool at a time. As of 1.06, you can send it to multiple, and you can choose whether you send it local or somewhere far away. So it's a lot easier to be summoned using the gold or the small golden effigy than it was before, which is really, really nice. Same rules apply though in terms of level and your weapon upgrade. So let's get a feel for where we're headed. We're going to be ignoring over to the east, which is where there is a lake. And we're going to be heading actually a little bit over to the west by those ruins and going to the church. We're actually going to go a little bit beyond the church and then loop around. But that's the plan, but all bypassing that enemy right there. That is actually a boss, and he is a rather difficult boss for our level. So we're just going to give him just a nice wide berth. And instead, head over here. We have some sheep that we can take care of. I'm also just on the lookout for more glowing skulls. Just a little heads up, you can play this way or not. I don't play with a claw grip, which is when you actually use your thumb to hit your standard buttons like jump and interact and sprint and all that, whereas you use your index and your middle fingers for your attacks. But I do kind of a modified version when I'm running. So what I'm doing right now, and it, it's hard to explain, I can't really show you, I'm sprinting using my thumb and I'm using my index finger of my right hand to actually control the camera just so it's a little bit more smooth. So let's go ahead and kill a sheep, see if we can get a drop from them. There we go. Thin beast bones, great. You can actually get more than one at a time. We do have some shinies over here by these ruins, and indeed they're called ruined fragments. I'm gonna stop just for a moment to look at that. I know, we haven't even gotten to the church and we're like 19 hours into this walkthrough. But if we go to, it's actually not a crafting material even though it can be used to craft, but under tools, we find the ruined fragment. It is a material, but it's also something that we can throw to get an enemy's attention. What I'd really like though, is actually the lore behind it. These shards, are believed to have once been part of a temple in the sky. They glow with a faint light from within. Now, they do have some very real uses apart from just throwing at enemies, but it also mentions ruins in the sky. And as you take a look at all of these ruins that have seemingly crumbled, it's beginning to paint a picture of something much, much bigger going on in the lands and really above the land between them first meets the eye. We also got a sliver of meat there. Sliver of meat can be used to craft immunizing cured meat, invigorating cured meat, dappled cured meat, clarifying cured meat, all sorts of meats. Those are defensive items. We'll talk about those when we get the opportunity to do so. And the ruined fragments, I failed to mention, can create uh, rainbow stones, script stones, glow stones, and rainbow stone arrows. I'm going to be picking these up along the way. So let's take a look. Any glowing skulls that I can see? There are not. There is another side of grace in that building. I'm actually going to bypass it for now. I want to get a little bit more loot. There's some, another herbly flower, and I want to hunt a few more animals, especially the birds. The nice thing about this configuration, the way I'm holding it, if I run across a crafting material, I could pick it up even without lifting up my fingers. So let's grab some sheep here. There's a nice twofer. Oh, and I even got a beast liver. The beast liver is used for a variety of dried livers. Fireproof, spellproof, lightning proof, holy proof. Essentially, again, another buff item that we won't be using for some time a couple of flight pinions there is a beach there is a large troll we will be heading there quite a ways from now so just ignoring it for the time being just getting some more beast bones regular skull no glow a couple more birds over here well one more bird over there no drop so I'm not actually gonna go further this way just yet. What I'm gonna do is loop back around. Here's a mushroom. Mushrooms are really, really good and I encourage you to pick them up at every chance you get. Mushrooms are used for pots. Throwing pots, rope pots, which are pots that you drop behind you, but really good offensive pots. And actually the consumables in Elden Ring are extremely, extremely powerful, especially fire pots early on. So to give you an idea of where we're at, so there is where we started. When we came out to Limgrave, there's the church. Again, I'm ignoring the church for now. I'm actually gonna go behind it. I just wanna show one small section behind it, and then we're gonna go in there and we're gonna do a little shopping. But here is Herba. So Herba is another very common item you're gonna find all over the place, and of course will respawn. And these create boluses. Boluses can reduce ailment status buildup, heal poison, and it's important for creating pickled turtle meat, which is disgusting, but actually a really, really useful consumable. 
So going beyond, I'm actually going to hop up on top of these rocks. And I'm going to go to this statue right here. We're going to talk briefly about this statue, even though we're not going to be employing its services right now. Oh, got some birds here. And no drop again. This is the statue of Rosas, the Usher of Death. And when you examine the statue, guide and gatekeeper for those returning to the root. And it's going to trail off in the distance, kind of like the Guidance of Grace. Every statue of Rosas that you find will point to a catacomb. Catacomb is kind of a dungeon that you can delve into. It always has a boss at the end. And some of them get very difficult. And some of them have some really good loot. We will be doing this catacomb soon. But I want to get a type of weapon, not necessarily a certain weapon, but a certain type of weapon before we do that. Here is something that everyone needs to get into the habit of. Whenever there is a message on your screen, clear it by using the interact. Otherwise, if you try to attack, if you try to roll, if you try to sprint, if you try to jump, you cannot until you clear that menu and then everything comes back. So again, we're ignoring that church just for now. I just want to show this little pond back here. Actually, right around here, there's another plant that is exceedingly rare to find just under the Statue of Roses. And that is a Trina's Lily. Trina's Lily is something that you're not going to be able to craft anything with it for a little while, but it is extremely valuable. Trina's Lily allow you to create sleep pots, sleep arrows and bolts, and soporific grease, all of which can put enemies to sleep. Very, very useful and being exceedingly rare to find, not going to respawn. We're not going to head up that way just yet. All I want to do is go and take care of this pond, talk about a couple new enemy types and a couple of other items that we can grab to uh, just really kind of flesh out our crafting abilities. These enemies right here are land squirts. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's what they're called. There's a note that we can buy later on that tells us we can actually use poison against them, which is interesting because they are poisonous themselves. But the other thing we can do is break their stance either by doing jump attacks or a nice charge R2 will typically do the trick. They will fall over and expose their underneath for a critical. So I'm going to do just that. Just run up, do a charge R2. There's the glowing spot indicating there's a critical available. And this time I'm just going to do a square off. It's a little bit faster same thing and the reason I actually do like to kill these enemies not everyone does they have a chance of dropping something really good they can actually drop a few things they can drop poison bloom they can drop uh, strips of white flesh they can also drop somewhat rarely a golden rune level 3 which is worth 800 runes now this obnoxious enemy is a great dragonfly now for those fellow entomologists out there, you know this is not a dragonfly. This is much more like a dobsonfly, the adult version of the Helgramite. But you know that. I knew that. But they call them dragonflies. I do like to collect their heads, if at all possible. The problem is it can become really obnoxious to kill because, as you can see, they just love to fly around. And it can become very dizzying. There is an Ash of War with a skill called Gravitas we can get pretty early on that will allow us to pull them down pretty easily but there we go there's one kill he did drop something and in fact we did get the great dragonfly head this is good for a neutralizing bolus it can also create immunizing cured meat immunizing white cured meat but the neutralizing bolus once we have the crafting ability that is going to both reduce poison buildup and heal poison which is extremely important there's another mushroom there is another dragonfly there i'm not going to take the time to kill it but i am going to take the time i'm sorry to kill the turtle here. Well, the tortoise, but I've already gone through the differences and some of the uh, similarities between turtles and tortoises. Ow! In my blind let's play. So if you want to know more about that, if you need your herpetology fix, go ahead and I'll try and get a link to that uh, specific discussion. Oh, there we go. Easy kill, then another dragonfly head. But the reason I want to kill Mr. Turtle is for what he drops. So I am just trying to get him out of his shell here with some charge R2s. No such luck, but he does drop the turtle neck meat. So we've already mentioned the pickled turtle meat. Well, here's exactly how you get some other crafting for it. The pickled turtle meat is a really valuable item because it increases your stamina regeneration. We can't make it just yet, but it will be available soon. 
also around here because the turtle does drop these naturally through, you know, biomechanical means. You can get gold-tinged excrement. Gross. With these, we can craft feta pots, rope feta pots, which causes poison buildup in ourselves and the intended target, provided we hit it. Now the early flower there, and all I'm doing here, there is a small cave up there. I'm going to ignore it. Just grab some more crafting materials. But over here, there is an owl. And the owl never flies away, fortunate for us. But killing him, we're going to get the slumbering egg. Now the slumbering egg, not exactly the most important item to get, but the slumbering egg can be used to craft clarifying cured meat, clarifying white cured meat, and stimulating boluses. At this point, we are finally going to make our way back to that church we saw. We're going to use, at long last, our lands between rune. We're going to buy some things, and then we're actually going to call it a part there, I think. Still, not a whole lot of progress, but, you know, we're getting there. Now, the goal for me is to have 4,300 runes before I go into this church. 4,300 runes. I have already said the lands between rune is going to get us 3,000. There's also directly outside the church. Again, we don't want to get caught by this guy, so let's back up. The Church of Ella. Don't want that tree sentinel to see us, so wait till he turns around. There we go. Fortunately, we have a skull here, so that's another 200. Right here, just out or just beneath this crucifix, we have Golden Rune Tune. That's 400. And then if we run across the way. We will have a few enemies to deal with, those flying bat creatures. Let's go deal with that, collecting any crafting materials along the way, or if we see any more glowing skulls. But I'm going to talk about another fighting mechanic called Guard Counter. Guard Counter is very, very simply guarding against an attack, and when the enemy hits you, you immediately hit the strong attack. If you do it right, you will actually hear the sound, and you'll do a Guard Counter, which deals a lot of staggered damage. Now, don't be like this foolish YouTuber that I once saw who believed that you had to time the block just like a parry. So you didn't actually block the whole time. You simply blocked when the attack was coming and that's how you got the guard counter to work. Um, yeah, I had to stop watching that YouTuber because he made that mistake far too often. But against these bats, so there is one down. That was a guard counter. Easier to see, oh, when I got grabbed. Okay, let's see. Get one, see if I can get them separated here. Should have done it there. Oh, there's the grab attack. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm actually gonna heal. Good thing I did. Another grab. If I get grabbed again, I am gonna die. And I would rather not end on a death. Boy, a bolus would be really nice right here, so I could reduce that. So I think what I need to do is actually kill one. Or get both with a guard counter. My apologies for that sloppy play and the, uh, quiet all of you, and the blood on my face. But yeah, that's a guard counter. Extremely, extremely valuable. But below this crucifix over here, we get another golden rune. So let's go to the church and let's see just how many runes we have once we've consumed all the ones we have. And of course, along the way, might as well attempt to get some more thin beast bones. And yes, that sheep was just about to try and roll away. It's hilarious. I encourage you to watch it as often as possible. So let's sit at the site of grace here in the Church of Ella. You can see that we get another Guidance of Grace pointing in that direction. That direction doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but when we open up the map, this symbol right here, this little monument symbol, that is a map fragment. When you're in a new area, see if you can locate that monument symbol, head that way, and you will actually get the map fragment that will open up what you can see. Just gonna rest up, get my health and my flask back. And here we have our first merchant. I love this merchant. I love all the merchants, but let's talk to Kale and hear what he has to say before we grab that item and do a bit of shopping. You're a tarnished. I can see it. And I can also see that you're not after my throat. Then why not purchase a little something? I am Kale, purveyor of fine goods. Let's talk a little bit more 
about Kale by uh, just asking him about himself and what he recommends. I am of a nomadic people, selling wares as I travel. The land has been tainted by madness since the shattering of the Elden Ring. It's only tarnished like yourself, who keep things from drying up entirely. Let's say you're a very welcome customer. You know, if you can spare the rooms, you should buy yourself a crafting kit. A crafting kit allows you to make basic items on your own. Essential, really, if you intend to survive out here for any duration. The kit costs a bundle, and I admit I do take my cut. But the important thing is that you survive. Every custom counts, after all. Thank you for the recommendation, Kale. One thing I failed to mention with uh, Whiteface Vari, and I meant to, is if you kill him, and honestly, I wouldn't blame you, he will drop 500 runes and 6 Festering Bloody Fingers, which are a PvP item. He does have a quest, however, so I encourage you to keep him alive despite what you may think about him. Uh, speaking of his quest, though, it used to be that you had to play online. In fact, you had to invade in order to advance that quest. As of 1.06, that is no longer the case, or it was a recent patch, I don't know if it was 1.06. You can actually perform an offline kill in order to advance that quest, which I really appreciate. I never like being forced to do online. With Kale, if you kill Nomadic Kale, you'll also get 500 runes, you'll get a finger snap gesture, which is important for another character later on, and you'll get Kale's bell bearing. Every merchant, when killed or if killed, will drop a bell bearing, and if you turn that into an NPC, at the hub, the round table hold that Whiteface Vary had mentioned, that NPC merchant can now carry the previous NPC's inventory. And you'll get bell bearings from other individuals as well, and you'll loot some to open up more inventory options there as well. Here's the thing. There is no downside to killing the merchants and then using their ball bearings, or their bell bearings rather, at the round table hold. When I say there's no consequences, no, no downfall to it, I'm of course not referring to the absolute moral bankruptcy you should feel if you do it, but mechanically speaking in game, there's no downside to it. I'm not going to, but I'll try to look the other way if you decide to do so. You can sell to all the merchants, which I appreciate, and selling also allows you to use all of your hard runes without going in and using them inside of your inventory. It also gives you the exact amount that they're worth, you don't lose anything by doing it this way. Like I said, I want 4,300 runes to get everything I want, so I'm gonna use my Lands Between rune. Now I'm at 3,900, and actually just using this one golden rune too will put me over the amount I want. I still have these three golden rune ones. So just doing one little loop and starting with the Lands Between gives me exactly enough to buy what I want. So let's start our purchase. I do want the telescope. This is just a fun little tool that allows you to see things at a distance, of course. He does sell throwing daggers. We're not gonna buy these because we're gonna be cr uh, crafting something very similar soon. Furl Calling Finger Remedies, again, online item, allows you to look for summon signs in your area when you're online. Cracked Pots. These are those throwable, consumable items that I talked about, but the Cracked Pots are never consumed. This is just an item that once you've actually used it, for example, you craft a firebomb and throw it, you actually will get the Cracked Pot back you just have to recraft it using a greeting. So I'm gonna buy all three of these, very useful. But then there's the crafting kit. Without this, we can't craft anything. So when I buy the crafting kit, you actually get some recipes right away. You can craft fire pots, roped fire pots, bone darts, rawa raisins, rainbow stones, and the furl calling finger remedy. So let's buy that. Then we have three cookbooks. This will expand our crafting repertoire. If you wanna see what you can craft without buying them, Simply use the switch display, which for me is square, and it'll tell you that this Nomadic Warriors Cookbook 1 can craft Bone Arrows, Bone Arrow Fletched, using those flight pinions, and Bone Bolts. The Warriors Cookbook number 2 is Glowstone, Invigorating Cured Meat, and Invigorating White Cured Meat. And the Missionaries Cookbook number 1 is Holy Water Pot and Roped Holy Water Pots. I'm going to show you where you can actually get the necessary components for the Holy Water Pots here very soon, because they're extremely useful. We're going to buy all three of these. We have 600 left, and I have 600 left that I want to buy. You can buy arrows and bolts. I'm not going to because we can craft them. You can buy a torch, though, and I do want to buy a torch. This is not just a source of light, but notice 
If I go to the explanation, that the type of damage is strike. Damage type matters. If an enemy has particularly hard skin, then a slashing item like a longsword isn't going to prove to be very effective, but a strike weapon like this torch can be very good. Not to mention, we're going to be going into some dark places, so I'm going to buy a torch. You can buy a large leather shield, it's a medium shield with the parry skill, but it doesn't have 100% physical damage reduction, so I'm not interested. You also have the chain set if you want some more Elden Bling. And then you have two notes, the Flask of Wonders Physic and the Waypoint Ruins. Unlike the cookbooks, you can't read what the note says, which makes sense. Otherwise, why would Kale sell this if you can just read what it says before? So if you try and read it, it just says further details are available only to paying customers. I'm going to buy both of these. I'm glad you took my warning to heart. You've made an excellent choice. Before we wrap up, I do want to take a look at the crafting menu. So now we have item crafting open to us because we bought the crafting kit. And we have a number of things that we can purchase, or not purchase, but craft. The invigorating meats, the fire pots, holy water pots, the roped versions, bone darts, which we can use just by, or we can craft just by using thin beast bones, which are equivalent essentially to the throwing knives, less damage, but can be used to get an enemy's attention and lure them in. Rawa raisins, which will heal our mount. Rainbow stones, which is a really brightly colored rock that, well, not only does it provide uh, color, but it can also tell you whether a fall is fatal. We'll show this off here later on. Glowstone, really nice actually. Now, it requires an item we can't get for some time, but using this instead of a torch is completely viable. Drop this in a room in a catacomb, it will illuminate the entire room. Furl Calling Finger Remedies, we talked about this. This is the online item, and then you have Bone Arrows, Fletch Bone Arrows, and Bone Bolts. We'll craft in the next episode. Lastly, the final item we're gonna get today is our first Smithing Stone. Smithing Stones come in a variety of levels. This is, of course, is the level one. And in order to get to our first upgrade, we still need two. You need two, then four, then six of all the different versions until you finally get to the ancient version which will max out your normal weapon upgrade at plus 25. Here, at this anvil, you do have the ability to strengthen the armament only up to plus three. After plus three, it will tell you it requires a further blacksmithing skill in order to go beyond. We won't be able to do that until we get invited to the hub, the round table hold. But here at the Church of Ella, right next to Kale, if we have the requisite runes and smithing stones, we could upgrade. It does tell you right here what it takes. 250 prunes plus two smithing stone level ones to upgrade the longsword. Halberd costs 480 runes. The heater shield costs 340. But we don't have the stone, so it doesn't matter at this time. But we'll be changing that here very soon. However, that is actually going to do it for this episode of Everything Possible in Elden Ring. Did we make it very far? No. Are we going to make it really far next time? Not a chance. But what I hope is that you learned something. And if you did, leave me a comment below and let me know what you learned. If I missed something or if you have anything else to add to this area, please leave that in a comment below so we can all keep learning. But I want to thank you all so much for watching. And I will see you next time.